Don't. Murray, come on. Every time you come down here, start yelling. Why? Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew, crew Time, Crew Time, Crew Time, Crew Time. Crew Time. If you are new around these parts, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. My name is Sarah, and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day. I know. I know. And I put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like a fun combination to you, you are in the right place. So make sure you subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification, and then that way you will never miss one of these terrible stories. Also, if you wanna see any of the makeup that I'm using in today's video, just look down in the description box. Everything is linked. If there is something I'm using that's super old and expired, <laughs> which is very likely, I will link something similar. I'm an elder millennial. Believe it, okay? I'm old. I'm the same age as the girl in this case, the woman. And the story sort of took place during a time in her like young adulthood. And it was a wild time during pop culture because of like reality TV, but you know, we're, we're gonna get there. This is the story of Jasmine Fiore. On August 15th, 2009, a grisly discovery was made in Buena Park, California, like South LA. A suitcase was found in a dumpster with a dead body stuffed inside. The body was that of a young woman. She had been strangled and beaten severely and all of her teeth were missing and her fingertips had been removed. So police knew that it was gonna make it very difficult to identify this person, which is, you know, very likely why the body was mutilated in that way. So the body was sent to the medical examiner and they actually made a very lucky discovery. So the woman had breast implants and anytime anything is inserted, implanted <laughs> in the human body, there's typically some kind of some kind of serial number or identifier on it. And that is all kept in a database just in case of like a safety concern or product recall. And that goes for breast implants, orthopedic plates, dental implants, IUDs, all of it. And then that serial number can be, you know, connected back to the doctor's office, the surgeon who put it in the body. Within three days, they were able to confirm that the breast implants belonged to Jasmine Fiore. Now, who was Jasmine Fiore? I'm glad you asked. Jasmine Lepore was born in Santa Cruz, California on February 18th, 1981. Jasmine led a very typical, happy childhood being raised by a strong single mama named Lisa. She grew up in Bonnie Dune, which is like Northwest of Santa Cruz. And she was quite the athlete and was a very formidable soccer player and played on her school's team. She was an animal lover and she grew up riding horses with local friends and she was, you know, super motivated and goal oriented. And she got her first job at age 16 at a local grocery store. She was described by many as very kind hearted and thoughtful. And she was the kind of person that would go out of her way to take care of her friends and family. As Jasmine grew into her teen years, she was becoming a strikingly beautiful woman. So much so that she was noticed by modeling agents that would kind of lurk around the local mall. Does anybody remember these modeling agents? It was kind of a crapshoot, you know? Either they were legit or it was just some weird dude with a ponytail and a fancy camera. <laughs> no offense to men with ponytails. Not all ponytails. All ponytails. Anywho, after high school, Jasmine decided to pursue modeling full-time with the ultimate goal of becoming a Playboy centerfold, just like her idol and inspiration, Marilyn Monroe. So 18 year old Jasmine started out as a bikini model. She was very good at it. You know, she was stunningly gorgeous. She worked in Los Angeles and Las Vegas as a body paint model at parties. And that segued into more like adult glamour modeling, you know, sexy stuff. Very, very Playboy-esque. <laughs> and over the next couple of years, she was pretty successful and she started seeing more recognition and fame and that converted into bigger paydays. So Jasmine was pretty aggressively pursuing this Playboy dream of hers. You know, she was submitting her photographs and all that. And while she didn't quite snag the centerfold or cover, she definitely had the Playboy 
boy look, and she started getting invited to the parties at the mansion. Then she finally booked an actual Playboy gig. She joined the Playboy's Girls Who Golf as like a host. And once she was in like the Playboy family, she transitioned into a role as an event coordinator for those mansion parties. And this was pretty huge because this was a time when like Playboy was king. The Girls Next Door was this mega hit show. You guys remember this, right? Like Hugh Hefner and his three girlfriends. <laughs> of course you do. What am I talking about? So Jasmine's star was on the rise and she decided that she needed to adopt a stage name. So Jasmine Lepore became Jasmine Fiore. So now the super hardworking, driven and ambitious Jasmine Fiore was doing really well, but the success and fame didn't go to her head. The stage name was actually meant to serve as like a privacy shield you know, so she could keep her private life private. Say what you will about a stereotypical, conventionally attractive bikini model, but Jasmine had her head on pretty straight and she stayed down to earth. She was also quite shrewd with her money. She got her real estate license and invested her money very wisely into some choice real estate spots around the LA area. So Jasmine had beauty, brains, and success, but what she really wanted was love. She had a couple of long-term relationships, but they didn't last. And actually one of them ended up in marriage, but they got divorced when he went to prison for some bad boy behavior. She got engaged again in 2005 to a guy named Travis, but they ended up calling off the engagement after a year. Although they did remain friends. She stayed friends with everybody. But then in 2009, Jasmine met the one. In March of 2009, 32-year-old Ryan Jenkins went out on the Las Vegas Strip with some friends. Ryan was originally from Canada, but he was living in Las Vegas working in real estate development. Ryan had big dreams. He always wanted to go to LA and be famous for what? I don't know. He wasn't an actor, but okay. I guess you don't have to be an actor to be famous, but okay, I'm getting off track. His real estate development was pretty successful, or at least he claimed it was. He claimed that he was a millionaire. Ryan was pretty charismatic type of a guy, you know, he had a very strong personality, he said all the right things, he was decent looking, you know, and he definitely had his sights on fame, like I said. Reality TV had been going strong for like a solid 10 years, and VH1 shows in particular were kind of the best. Rock of Love, Flavor of Love, I Love New York, I Love Money, Charm School, The Pickup Artist, Tool Academy. You guys, these shows were just straight up bangers. Flat me, bitch. You guys remember these shows, right? Right? Anyway, so Ryan had actually just finished taping a reality show Megan Wants a Millionaire. Megan Wants a Millionaire centered around Megan Hauserman. She was a former Playboy model and she had been on Beauty and the Geek, which was not a VH1 show, but she was a former contestant on season two of Rock of Love with Brett Michaels. If you've never had the pleasure of watching Rock of Love, what, what have you been doing with your life? Just give me a kiss, no. please. But it's essentially, it's The Bachelor, but with Brett Michaels from Poison and a bunch of groupies. I love Brett Michaels. So Megan Wants a Millionaire has her as the bachelorette pretty much, but all the guys competing to win her to be their trophy wife had to be rich. You get it. This show filmed in February of 2009. So Ryan was a contestant on Megan Wants a Millionaire and he actually performed quite well. You know, he made it into the top three. It's a pimp cup. <laughs> <laughs> I typically date girls that turn a lot of heads. I love the chase. Ryan's nickname on the show was the smooth operator. Save me a spot for dinner, okay? And Megan would later say that they had an instant connection. Hey, let's in on a little secret. Please do. Ryan whispers in my ear, you're gonna love Canadian bacon. Charming. Wow. Okay, so Ryan Jenkins actually seemed to be Megan's number one top choice. I'm a little bit of a Prince Charming, a little bit of a bad boy. <laughs> Yummy. But the network kind of steered her into a different direction for a couple of reasons. Number one, VH1 had already booked Ryan for an upcoming season of I Love Money. I guess I don't really know why that would have been a conflict, but maybe. But I think the real reason was Ryan's edit wasn't good. 
unlikable, and the producers never expressly told Megan that she couldn't pick Ryan. It was more that she shouldn't. Since he was pretty much the villain, it wouldn't have been good for the audience, you know, blah blah blah. At the end of the day, none of that really mattered because the show only aired three episodes. But we'll get to that. So even though Ryan's villain storyline got in the way of him ending up with Megan publicly, Megan did believe that they had something, you know, that they wanted to pursue outside of the show. They exchanged phone numbers and at the end of filming, Megan gave Ryan a call, but it didn't go as planned. So I just thought that I would just call him in like three days and explain to him the situation. But then he called me and told me he had met the love of his life in Vegas and that they were married. You snooze, you lose, Megan. I was shocked because three days before he was telling me I was the love of his life. Jasmine was out partying in Las Vegas one night when Ryan rolled up into a casino with his boys. He was immediately drawn to her. And they got to talking and he asked for her phone number. So she put her info in his phone, her phone number and her birthday. When Ryan saw her birthday, he realized that their birthdays were just days apart and that's it. A sign from above. She's the one. Well, Jasmine, the romantic, I guess, agreed. Two days later, they got married at the Little White Wedding Chapel in Las Vegas. The Little White Wedding Chapel has seen many elopements, many uh, impromptu weddings. <laughs> A lot of famous people too. Pretty sure Michael Jordan got married there. Um, Joe Jonas, it's not really working out well. Ben and Jen, and Queen Britney Spears. God, I love my life. I love my wife. Luckiest guy in the world. Where are we at? Um, in wishing well. Wishing well. So are you going to make a wish? Come on, girl. Come on. Aww. So it seems that this whirlwind romance was maybe more toxic tornado. Just a few months after they were married and right before Ryan left to film for I Love Money, Ryan was arrested and charged with domestic violence after hitting Jasmine in the arm and pushing her into a swimming pool. Ryan was extremely jealous and insecure and he hated when Jasmine would talk to her exes, but she was amicable and on friendly terms with all of them. Jasmine's mother, Lisa, would later say that the couple's relationship was pretty dysfunctional, unhealthy. You know, they would fight constantly, it was explosive, and Ryan wasn't as financially successful as he claimed to be, and Jasmine was carrying a lot of the load for them. And they had an apartment in LA and in Vegas. So there was a lot going on. Travis Heinrich, Jasmine's former fiance and friend, was actually present during that altercation at the pool. He said that Jasmine and Ryan were fighting over their friendship, you know, her friendship with him and her other exes. He also said that Ryan was extremely jealous and controlling. Ryan's father, Dan Jenkins, would later say that Jasmine was the only person that Ryan knew in California where they ended up living full time. And she would leave him for long periods of time and then lie about it. Just seemed dysfunctional on both sides, you know. Who, who knows? Well, after that domestic violence incident that Ryan actually ended up spending a couple days in jail for, good, they had separated. And Jasmine's mother, Lisa, would later say that Jasmine had the marriage annulled that May, although there's no record of that. At any rate, it seems like Jasmine was really kind of ready to cut her losses. That incident was also not Ryan's only brush with the law or his first domestic violence charge. He was charged and convicted of assault on a girlfriend in January of 2007. And for this little incident, he was sentenced to 15 months of probation and counseling for sex addiction. Yet somehow this man was allowed to enter a VH1 filming house for a reality show centered around Megan Hauserman. We do psychological evaluations and background checks on everybody who appeared on any of our shows, as all reality shows at the time did, and Ryan came back clear. His father had his arrest expunged, so it wasn't easily found when they did the background check. And that little snafu actually ended up in a huge lawsuit that cost like a million dollars. Okay, so hoping some time and space 
would bring them back together, Ryan went off to Mexico for five weeks to film I Love Money. He believed in his soul of souls that if he could win the show and the prize money, it would be enough to impress Jasmine and win her back. While he was on the show filming, he constantly called Jasmine to tell her how he was doing on the show and to talk about how they were gonna spend the money that he was gonna win. These phone calls were actually worked into a storyline because he was always on the phone. Also always arguing, you know, like, where are you? Who are you with? What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. They're, they're estranged at this point. They're not even really together, but okay. Wouldn't you know it, he actually did win. Somehow Ryan came out on top of all the other contestants and he took home that cash prize of $250,000. He returned from production in early August, but that show never aired either but we'll come back to that too. Jasmine actually decided to give Ryan one more chance. And on August 13th, 2009, she and Ryan arrived at the La Berge Del Mar Hotel in San Diego. They were in town to attend the charity poker tournament fundraiser at the Del Mar Hilton. And according to friends and people who saw them that evening, she was being very rude and kept putting Ryan down. It became awkward for everyone. Well, as beautiful and kind-natured as Jasmine normally was, it seemed like she was fed up with him over it. And she also had a very cutting sense of humor and Ryan was getting the brunt of it on the evening of the 13th of August. And Ryan became very irate in return, you know. They actually ended up leaving the poker table and around 2 a.m. or so, they went to the Ivy Hotel nightclub in downtown, like after party vibes, you know. At 4.30 a.m., Ryan was seen on the security footage returning to the Lomberge Hotel alone. Then a few hours later, he left the hotel, like checked out, and he was seen on the security footage carrying his clothes in his hands. The suitcase that was seen on the security footage when they checked in was conspicuously missing. On August 15th, 2009, just before 9 p.m., Ryan reported Jasmine missing, saying that he had last seen her at 8.30 p.m. on the 14th at their home in LA when they returned from San Diego. Ryan said that she had gone out to run errands and never returned. And usually she would like call her mom or her girlfriends when she disappeared, but this time, nobody had heard from her or seen her. The next day, Ryan went to Nevada to go pick up his speedboat, which that's kind of a weird thing to do when your wife is missing, right? Well, on August 17th, law enforcement reached out to Ryan regarding his missing persons report and this Jane Doe that they had found in the dumpster in Buena Park. Ryan told them that he was in Utah on his way to Canada because he needed to deal with some immigration issues very interesting timing. He also spoke with his father to tell him that Jasmine had run off again and it seemed like this time things were over. What happened the next day? Ryan's missing wife was identified as that woman in the dumpster and it seemed like he was making a run for the border. Police started squinting at Ryan and they didn't issue any charges, but they definitely alerted the Canadian authorities. Jasmine's white Mercedes Benz was actually found in a parking lot in West Hollywood next to a grocery store about a mile from their apartment. It wasn't made public at first, but the interior of the car indicated a very violent struggle took place inside of it. Blood was everywhere all over the passenger seat, all over the back seat, all over the back windscreen, and there was evidence of attempts to wipe it away. And the blood in the back seat was significant. On the 19th, Ryan's father, Dan, called his son to tell him what he had seen on the news, that Jasmine was found dead. And he says that Ryan totally broke down crying. Dan would later tell the Vancouver Sun that he assumed that Ryan must have panicked, you know, thinking that he was the prime suspect. So he jumped in his boat and drove into Canada by way of the water. I mean, that's definitely what happened, but I think the conversation went more like, they found the body, get the fuck over the border ASAP. When the police caught up with Ryan's SUV and empty boat trailer in Blaine, Washington, which is right on the border, the engine was still warm. Ryan was somehow one step ahead of authorities. 
somehow. They found the body. Get the fuck over the border ASAP. Ryan's father actually tried to hop a plane into Canada to meet up with his son for support and he was detained at the border. Ryan actually called him when he was there, but he says, well, cell phones weren't allowed in the area, so I wasn't allowed to talk to him. Okay. One other little nugget that I haven't really gotten to is that while Ryan was gone in Mexico filming I Love Money, he and Jasmine were estranged, right? And Jasmine's ex-husband, Michael, was released from prison. Now, the only reason that Michael and Jasmine ever got divorced in the first place is because he got sent to prison. But when he got the jump, Jasmine drove down to San Diego to meet him. They picked up right where they left off, and when Jasmine's body was examined, they found Michael's DNA in it. You know where. So police actually questioned Michael, but he had a rock solid alibi in his ankle monitor. <laughs> if Jasmine had hooked up with Michael just a few days before reconciling with Ryan, it would stand to reason that maybe that was a point of contention, that he was insanely jealous. And many witnesses in San Diego say that they witnessed them arguing loudly. You know, maybe she told him. Well, Megan Wants a Millionaire premiered on August 2nd, meaning three episodes aired by the time Jasmine's dead body was found and Ryan had become the prime suspect. With all this terrible publicity, the rest of Megan Wants a Millionaire was canceled. And the entire season three of I Love Money, which Ryan won, never made it onto the air. On Thursday, August 20th, 2009, just shy of one week from Jasmine's tragic and brutal murder, Ryan Alexander Jenkins was officially charged with her murder and he was a fugitive. That same day, just after 6 p.m., a very pretty young blonde woman walked into the Thunderbird Motel in Hope, British Columbia, Canada, and paid cash for a three night stay. The car that she had arrived in was being driven by a man who stayed in it. It was a silver PT cruiser. He stayed behind when she went inside to get the room key. Spoiler alert, it was Ryan, and the woman was his half-sister. The motel owner said that the driver, Ryan, parked beside the dumpster instead of the side of the rooms where everybody else parked, which was suspicious to him and made him take notice. He also noticed that the vehicle had Alberta license plates. About 20 minutes after checking in, the woman, left. The manhunt for Ryan continued and ventured into international territory because Ryan was a Canadian citizen, but it would be a short-lived search effort because when the couple that checked into the motel didn't check out after the third night, the manager called the room, no answer, then he knocked on the door, no answer, then he opened the door and there was Ryan, dead having hanged himself from the coat rack. Reality show contestant Ryan Jenkins was found hanging by a belt from a coat rack at the Thunderbird Motel in Hope, British Columbia on Sunday night. Police had been searching for the former real estate developer since his ex-wife Jasmine Fiore's body was found on August 15th. The manager said, quote, I swung the door open and there he was right in front of me hanging. And the room when I walked in there smelled like death. And to tell you the truth, what I thought when I first saw him was he looked demonic. That's the only way I can describe it. I don't think I'll ever forget it. Saved on Ryan's laptop hard drive was a document dated August 20th titled Last Will and Testament. This de facto suicide note blamed Jasmine for the state of their relationship. There was a lot of stuff written in this note, but essentially he wrote that he loved Jasmine, but then he blamed her and then said that she would sleep with her former boyfriends to make him mad. The police never released the note, but the sergeant did say that Ryan never said how Jasmine died in it or what happened that evening between between them, but there were incriminating statements throughout the letter. Ryan also asked that all of his money and assets go to his family, and he apologized for all the negative media coverage that they had to endure. Some of Ryan's friends and family members gave TV interviews, and they all expressed their sympathy for Jasmine's tragic and brutal death, but they could not accept the fact that Ryan was capable of such a thing. They collectively expressed that Ryan's suicide was not the result of a guilty man with the walls closing in on him, but of a despondent man suffering intense grief being painted as a monster. I think he was terrified beyond belief and it just seemed to push him over the edge that he was never going to be able to, to yeah. uh, 
walk away or prove for, uh, prove his innocence with with the uh, the smear of what was going on about him. Okay. And it was just so terribly unfair. Jasmine's mother Lisa later said that although Ryan took the coward's way out to avoid being held accountable and brought to justice, she was glad that it meant that her family would be spared a long, stressful pursuit, trial, and all the rest. She wanted to have faith in him. She wanted to give him a second chance. Um, she was willing to, I guess, take that risk. I'm sure he was very convincing. I think that he was just very good at, um, I think he was like professional con artist. It's just, you know, how it's a, a young woman who's, you know, in love, like, and that is the story of Jasmine Fiore. Again, if you want to see any of the makeup items that I used in today's Luke, just look down in the description box. Everything is linked for you. If you have a crew crime story that you would like to recommend to me, there's also down in the description box, a Google document where you can fill in all of the details. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me everywhere else. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! Once the body arrived... Hello. It's clumpy. I really need to do some skin prep today. My face is busted. Oh, was that not recording? Fuck. Beautiful. Oh my god. Oh, there was just... Water, water, water. <laughs> Hello.